we can. For our guests and those of you who are new to church, my name is Chad. I'm one of the pastors. Uh, welcome again to ICS Church. It's good to have you with us today and also in this Christmas season. We have been doing a teaching series called Open Hands, Full Hearts. Pastor Topher got me confused here just for a minute. Open Hands, Full Hearts. And uh, it's been a series about the generosity of God. Um, how God expects us to be generous as He is, and when we are generous through kindness, we actually are like God. We learn that um, when it comes to giving, our attitude, how we give, how we give is more important than what we give or the amount that we give. Paul reminds us of these things. And so I hope you've been uh, benefiting from this series. If you missed it, want to catch up, just go to any of our social uh, media channels and uh, you can find out more there. This is one of our two services every Sunday. Again, if you're a guest, uh, we have a Tagalog English service at 8 a.m. 10.30 a.m. is our international service or our English service. And so you're welcome to connect with us in any of these gatherings on weekends. The title for today's message is Extraordinary Provision. Extraordinary Provision. How many of you feel like your work is easy? Work is easy. Monday to Friday, it's easy peasy. Look forward to it. You know, uh, even I think those of us in ministry, it doesn't matter what kind of work it is, whether you're a graveyard shifter or a nine to five, whether you're a freelancer or a vocational minister, vocational ministry, meaning, you know, you, you do ministry full time. Uh, all kinds of work, it seems, is hard, right? It requires a bit of hard work. There is some toil involved. I like that word, toil. It's, it's, not a, it's not a common English word that we use, but there is toil involved. So there is work and usually hard work, hard work. In fact, some of us probably found it hard to wake up this morning, but you did and you came to church anyway. Because you know what, man, the week has been long, it's been full. I know for our team, and, and I just shout out to our volunteers yesterday, they came, they made a commitment, and they like, you know, they serve the pastors of our section in, in our district here, the Assemblies of God. Um, it, got, it got extended by about maybe an hour or two hours, but they served cheerfully, am I right? Cheerfully, because they came back Sunday morning, bright and early, ready to do it again, ready to do it again. And you know, it's, it's, it's hard. Sometimes even if it's something that you like to do, it gets difficult. You know why? And for those of you maybe, you know, you're new to Christianity or you haven't been a Christian for a long time, it all started in Genesis chapter 3. Since Genesis chapter 3, work has been hard. Before Genesis chapter 3, work was like, man, it's all good. Jesus told Adam and Eve, wake up in the morning, you can eat whatever you want. You want to live forever? Just take the fruit from the tree of life. Live forever. And there was no war between the animal kingdom and people. Animals didn't want to eat people. People didn't want to eat animals, right? Everybody was vegetarian, and it was all good. But Genesis chapter 3, sin came, difficulty came, conflict came, decay entered into the world. And from that point on, work became hard. God told uh, Adam, you will now have to toil the ground. There will be thistles that will grow out of the ground, it won't be as easy anymore. And for women, when it comes to childbirth, it's going to be difficult. So apparently, right, if sin didn't happen, childbirth would have been easy. But now after Genesis chapter 3, God says there's going to be some strife, some difficulty, some hardness to life because of sin because of sin. It's, it's one of those things. Now work isn't bad because God is a worker. God created, and He saw what He created was good. But because of sin, even now, as we are co-creators with God, with work, as students, as workers, it has become hard. Even at times when we feel like, you know what, there is joy in this, but it is hard. It is difficult. 
We need to toil sometimes even without a harvest. You experience that? You work so hard, you even put in some overtime, and at the end of the day, man, this is not even enough <laughs> for what I need. And it seems, man, life is hard. Or what I'm doing is hard. When times are good, it's good. When times are hard, it's hard. Sometimes even more hard. And sometimes the toiling and the results of good toil, even with a good harvest, sometimes it disappears just like that for various reasons. For some, you know, you, you've toiled hard, you've worked hard, you've amassed wealth, but then your life will be required of you, meaning you're going to be dying today. And all of that, man, I didn't even enjoy it. It's gone. Some because of natural disasters. Hey, Philippines. That's not something we are not used to. <laughs> Natural disasters, all these storms that come, and you've built fine houses, you have a good business, a storm comes and washes everything away, just like that. It's gone, your hard work, your toil. Some, it's sickness, for some people it's robbery, for some people it's misuse of funds, and it just disappears, all that hard work, all the fruitfulness immediately gone. What do we do? In the, in the times when it is most difficult and it seems provisions has run short. Sometimes even with a good job, even though you're toiling, you've been toiling well, but for whatever reason, it's just not enough. How do you respond to seasons like that? How do you respond when what you have materially, financially, may be insufficient. How does that affect your faith? How does that affect your demeanor, your relationship, your attitude when it comes to life? Here's a thought. I've been thinking about this in preparation. What we do on ordinary days prepares you for the hard or difficult days. Whatever habits that are being formed on regular, ordinary, normal days, Actually, that becomes a setup for how we would respond on those unusual, a lot of times hard and difficult days. This morning, we want to learn how can we continue to experience peace, joy, and even abundance in a season of lack. You say, hey, Pastor Chad, it's kind of like, that's not normal. <laughs> Nobody experiences peace, joy and abundance in lack that doesn't make sense. I know. In a world without God, it doesn't make sense. But for those of us who belong to the kingdom of God, we have an idea about what that's all about. And so if you're new to faith, or maybe you've been a Christian for a while and you've forgotten about what it means to live in the kingdom of God, or you're just here checking out what is this church about, what do Christians actually believe, listen in, lean in, because that's what we're going to unpack today. How can we experience extraordinary provision in extraordinary times? We're going to look at a man in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant part of the Bible. His name is Elijah. So for those who aren't familiar with Elijah, a little background on him, he is a Jew, and his calling is to be a prophet. So in the Old Testament, if you're called a prophet, if God appoints you as a prophet, you become a spokesperson for God, specifically delivering his message to his people. And for Elijah, it was primarily to King Ahab, a king in Israel and to Israel, which is at that point was kind of uh, swaying away or moving away from the things of God. And so God raised up Elijah to speak to Ahab and to Jezebel, his wife, and to call the nation back to himself in repentance, to call the nation back to himself in obedience. Now Elijah, um, as a prophet, heard from God, delivered the message, and the reason for that is uh, the, the message that they received was only confined in, in the Torah. These were moral codes and standards and traditions that Israel was supposed to uphold. And there were situations that were specific that they were breaking, and Elijah had to call people back to himself. Thankfully today we have the full Word of God, uh, God's Word revealed to us in Jesus coming on earth, God in the flesh. Uh, we have a full revelation of who God is and what God's like, even though the gift of prophecy is still functioning, 
in the world today where God raises up people and allows them to speak forth His Word in season and in time, we have the Word of God revealed. And so this is a bit of Elijah. This is who he was. And so we're going to pick up the story because Elijah went through a season of lack as well. Yes. Even those of us who are closest to God or seemingly closest to God do experience times of lack. So how did Elijah deal with it? How did it affect his life and even those around him? 1 Kings chapter 17 is where we pick up a story. We're going to be reading almost the entire chapter this morning. So for those of you who like many verses, hey, you're in for a treat. We're going to read a lot of verses today. 1 Kings chapter 17, it says here, Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, the Israel king, As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. So again, God's message, Elijah delivering it to King Ahab. There's going to be El Nino. There's going to be famine. There's going to be drought for the next few years. And the result, the reason for this is, one, is possibly because of the judgment of God, their disobedience. And God is hoping that this will cause them to turn to faith in Him, to call upon Him. And unfortunately, we don't really see that happening in King Ahab's life. But he has been given the warning. Famine is coming. Drought is coming. Don't you, don't you love it when the forecast is correct for weathers? So you know, uh, weather forecasting, especially in the Philippines, they say it's a science and an art. It's a science because you look at all the evidence that's there, satellite, with all modern technology, but at the end of the day, weather forecasters have to give a scientific guess, right? And it's a hit and miss. In the last couple of weeks, schools have been canceled, and it was so hot. Last Sunday, meetings were canceled at church, and I'm like, no, don't cancel the meetings. And it just drizzled in Manila, <laughs> right? And we're like, we shouldn't have canceled. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I love weather forecasters. I, 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 I watch it. I listen to it. But it's a hit or miss. And here it is. Did you know that God was a weather forecaster? And so God tells uh, Elijah, forecast the weather. There's going to be drought. Not this week. For several years, whoa, what kind of weather forecasting is this? This is long-term weather forecast. And he says, until I give the word, there's going to be drought. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. A couple of weird things. In this right now, one, you know, when, when, when drought happens, even though you're close to God, you get affected, right? When pandemic happened, you were close to God, but you still had to be in lockdown. You had to stay inside. And even though, you know, you're far away from China, you still got COVID. Come on. So there are some situations around the world that's going to happen. And we get affected. Elijah was getting affected. He delivered the message, and now he too was getting affected by the drought. Good news! God had a solution. He said, go to the brook. Go to the brook, a Kareth brook, and you can drink from the river. And here's an unusual thing. Did you guys pick it up? I'm going to send a raven. Have you ever seen ravens bring food? Right? This is God's version of grab in the Old Testament. <laughs> I'm going to deliver food to you uh, where you are. That's unusual. Um, ravens don't bring food. Ravens steal food. They steal food. They take food, not just ravens, but any kind of bird. You know, there are, there are some countries where, you know, if you go to the beach, there's a lot of seagulls. And you're just eating your, you're enjoying your fish and chips. Right? And if you're not careful, seagull comes in and steals it away. Just like, that's what birds do. They don't come and say, oh, look, somebody's having a holiday. They're having a picnic. Let me bring you food. That doesn't happen in the animal kingdom. And so here that's unusual. <laughs> but this is God's instruction to Elijah. Go there, and you're going to get food. So Elijah 
didn't even ask a question. It says here, Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped, camped. Like, that's, this is long term. I'm going to set up tent and stay here. And camped beside Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. And sure enough, the ravens brought him bread. And not just bread, the ravens brought him meat. I wonder where that meat came from. Another carcass, you know, I mean, ravens do that, right? Like dead, dead animals, they pick. I don't know. <laughs> but there was, there was bread, and it's not just bread. Hey, you got your carbs, and God is concerned as well. You need your protein. Come on. Come on. Uh, those who are concerned about their health, you need your carbs, you need protein. When it comes to other things, you know, Elijah, you're on your own. I'm doing my part. So you got your carbs, you got your protein, and it says here, it came morning and evening. And he drank from the brook. That's just fresh water, clean water. Right? Ample supply. It was all there. How good is this? How would you like that? It's like, you know what? I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough to order on my grab right now. And then somebody tells you, hey, I've got something to give to you. Oh, come on. Pastor Jabez was sharing to us this morning uh, that last week, you know, uh, things were canceled. They're going to go out with the youth to eat. And he's thinking, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? I don't even know if I have enough to feed these kids. You know, teens eat a lot. And so before he goes out, somebody says, hey, have you guys eaten? Another member from the church. And he's, le he's like, uh, no, we haven't, and, and pulls out and he says, this is for you. I give this with gladness, all right? So it's like application of the sermon right away. I give this with cheerfulness to you. And that's like an answer. Don't you want that? It's like, you know, if you're hungry, you're expecting, and, and nobody's picking up, grab keeps canceling, all of a sudden somebody knocks on your door, here's food. Here's food. That seems to be happening quite frequently at ICS this past couple of days. Food just keeps coming. It keeps flooding, and it's like, man, it just keeps coming, you know? Before we have lunch, the food is already there, and like, you're only thinking about it, and the food suddenly appears. And uh, we are blessed in this church, man. We are blessed in this church. Um, it happens. It happens. But you know, apparently even God, when He does things this way, it's seasonal. It's seasonal. Verse 7 says, but after a while the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Again, famine is still there, drought is still there. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. A widow. So again, Elijah, no questions. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, sure enough. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? Now you know when you meet somebody for the first time, it's only right to first of all introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Elijah, I'm God's prophet, can I please have some water? He doesn't do that, right? He's just, he just comes in, it's, it's a woman gathering wood. Can I have some water? Very bold. Very bold. Can I please have some water? No, don't even say please there. Can I have some water? As she was going to get it, he called her, bring me a bite of bread too. Come on. Come on. How many of you guys, when somebody comes to your house, now in our culture we do this. Somebody comes in, knocks on the door, if it's familiar, hey, come on in. Kumain kanaba. Have you eaten? <laughs> That's our greeting in the Philippines or in most Asian countries. It's not hi, hello, komustaka. It is, have you eaten? That's the greeting that we give. It's only nice or right to do that. Here is the opposite. The widow is not asking Elijah, have you had a, anything to drink? No, Elijah, a stranger, a complete stranger, goes to the widow and says, can I have some water? And when she comes back, oh yeah, by the way, as you're coming back, can you bring me some food too? <laughs> Can you imagine this conversation right now? And she's probably thinking, who's this guy? I don't even know him. Why is he asking me for all of these things? 
But she said, I swear. Now he brings him water, but then he's, he's beginning to ask for food. He's asking for more. I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just getting a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. You, know, you, you want to scare people away from getting stuff from you, that, that's a good script. Can I please have some? I don't have anything. Last food, I'm going to die. Mamamatay na ako, humingi ko pa sa akin. It's like, I mean, imagine this is like, she's probably like, oh man, why is he even, I don't have it. And do we think, is she making this up? No, there was drought in the land. There was drought in the land. Nobody has, has been able to harvest or plant or sow or get decent food to eat. And not only that, she's a widow. What does that mean? If you're a widow, you don't have rights. If you don't have a husband, nobody can work for your family. You can lose your property. You can end up on the street because you need a husband. It was a paternal culture. There had to be a man, right? Only man had the right to own. Only man had the right to work decent jobs. If you were a widow, you're on your own. I'm a widow. I'm about to die. I don't even have anybody to fend for me, to protect me, to provide for me. And now you're asking me to give you my last meal? This is for me and my son. We're going to die. And you would think, you know, man of God, kind, considerate, patient, loving, would move on. Maybe it's the wrong widow. God, I think you made a mistake. Maybe I'm supposed to be led to a rich widow. This widow is about to die. Did you make a mistake, Lord? But Elijah doesn't ask that question. Elijah continues on in the conversation, and, and he says here in verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Can you say that with me? Don't be afraid. Come on, tell it to somebody beside you. Don't be afraid. So Elijah says, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. <laughs> All right? So, okay. I'm going to believe you. It's your last meal. Go ahead and do. Prepare your meal. Right? But cook for me first. <laughs> Man, Elijah must really be so hungry at, at this point in, in time. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. If there's anything left over, that's for you. What a considerate minister. Wow. You know, if, if a pastor visits your home, <laughs> right? You know, it's not something that you want. I'm like, I don't want to see this pastor back in my house again. He's taking everything, eating everything, nothing left for me. But why did he say this? I mean, there was so much confidence in Elijah. There was so much confidence in his demeanor and the words that he was saying. Why? Again, because he was a prophet. He was somebody who was walking close to God. He knew God's heart. He knew what God was like. He had experienced God in his life. And there was just a previous miracle he came from, remember? a carith and a raven. So I'm sure at this point he was like, yeah, okay, you know, that's what God said, because God said it, I'm just going to do it. And so here in confidence he continues on, he says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. He didn't say, this is what I think is going to happen, or let me just say this just so that you can be forced to give me food. No, this is what the Lord said, the statement of confidence. He knew God. He heard from God. It's a message that was not just for him. He came to also deliver a message to the widow that when you respond to this request, it's not just going to meet my need, it's also going to meet your need and more. Isn't that good? That is so good. So she did, no more arguments, she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. Wait, didn't she say there was only like one more and a little more drop, like last drop? How can that last for many days? Because 
What happened was exactly what Elijah prophesied would happen. This is what the Lord said, you will not run out. There will always be oil, there will always be flour, and it will continue to come until the drought ends. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the container just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. This is so good. I mean, we could end it right here, and it's like, man, that is so good. Let's just go. Let's just go. Let's look for widows, and, uh, you know, let's see and how God is going to provide for them. But a couple of insights just from here when it comes to extraordinary provision and that life of faith that Elijah lives. Number one, everyone goes through a season of lack, even God's prophets. Even God's prophets. Even if you're close to God, there will be a season and a time when there will be lack in life. There will not be sufficient material things, provisions in your life. It's just going to happen. Why? Because that's the world that we live in. There is still El Nino in the world today. There are still economic challenges. There are still recessions. There are still droughts, famines, pestilence, wars that affect provisions, finance, economy. And just because you know God doesn't mean you're spared from it, because we also live in this world. But the good news is, if it does happen, God has a way so that you can continue to live with joy, peace, and abundance. Second observation, following God's direction leads to God's provision. Elijah followed God's direction. No questions. Elijah, there's a drought coming. Go to the brook at Kareth, because you'll get water there, and while you're there, you don't even have to order, you don't even have to plant, you don't even have to toil. I will send a raven daily, morning and evening, to provide what you need. Carbs, protein. It's like complete, man. God covers it all. I'm going to provide what you need. But for us to experience that provision, what do we need to do? We need to follow God's direction. And I believe for some of us, we miss out on the provision of God because we still refuse to follow His direction for us. What was the last thing that God instructed you to do? Have you obeyed it? Have you followed that direction? Because as long as we delay, it's possible that we are missing the blessing that God wants to release in our life. What if Elijah said, I don't want to go there, God. I don't go to Brook Carey. That's far. Why don't you send the raven to me? <laughs> Demanding, right? Now I'm at Kareth, and you're telling me to go to Zarephath, to Sidon? That's up north. Cherith is down south. Sidon is up north, and there is drought in the land. Now you want me to travel all the way there and look for somebody I don't even know? Nope, no questions. Elijah did what God instructed him to do. Why? Because he knew God so well. He had been walking with God by faith long enough to know that when God gives an instruction, he will fulfill it. When God gives a direction and you follow it, what he said will come to pass. So he followed the direction, and sure enough, the provision came. Third observation, obedience to God's instruction unleashes miracles in our life and the life of others. See, when we actually obey what God has instructed for us to do, yes, He's true to His Word. He, he doesn't like like man. No, He is true to His Word. He cannot lie. He cannot go against His nature. He's only a truth teller. That's what God is. And when we follow His instruction and His commands, the miracles that are released in our life is not just for us. The miracle of provision, that's a miracle. Ravens don't give food, but they gave. Why? Because Elijah obeyed God. Wait, this is the last flour, scoop of flour. This is the last drop of oil. But because you obeyed Elijah and the widow obeyed Elijah's word that God gave to Elijah, there was a trickle down and a ripple effect. He trusted the Word of God that came from the prophet of God, and sure enough, God fulfilled His promise to Elijah by providing for him and Sidon, and not just for him, 
by unleashing the miracle in this widow's household that allowed them to be fed all the way to the end. Some of us just need to follow the direction and actually obey God in times and seasons of of lack and extraordinary challenges. God is saying, you know what, I'm, I'm here, I'm present, I'm with you, and I'm waiting to release my miracles and to provide for you. I just need you to follow me, obey me, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen. When we do, this is what happens, just like it happened to Elijah, to the widow, and to her family. Now you would think, man, let's end the story here because that's good. That's it. That's the end of the story, but it's not. There are a couple more verses in this chapter, and what follows is kind of surprising. You would think that, hey, for many days it's all good, provision is coming, and it's all good, but then God does something kind of a, a different, because while they're in, the basic needs are being met, all of a sudden the son gets sick and he dies. Wow, that's so anticlimactic. Right? All these provisions were coming, miracle after miracle, then all of a sudden the son dies. And the widow is confused, and he's like, who are you really? Why did you come here? Are you here because of my past sins? Is that why my son has died? Why these negative results are happening? And, and, and she's still brought back. You know, and you're forgetting there is a drought going on and you're being saved, and now because of what happened here, you're thinking you're cursed. And Elijah is also a little bit confused. Do you know that even people who are close to God sometimes don't have all the answers? Because apparently the word that God gave to him was only up to that point in time. Go to the widow, provision will come. God had not told him that the son would die. Maybe if God told him that the son would die, he wouldn't have gone. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But he didn't know. How do we know he didn't know? Because Elijah asked God in the next verses, he said, why did you bring me here? Why did you allow this tragedy to happen? But he still had confidence in his God. He still had faith in his God that you have a purpose for me being here. You've allowed me to stay here. You're not yet done with me here. You took me out of the brook when it dried up. You placed me in this new place, and now there's a new challenge but you haven't asked me to go. Lord, what do you want me to do? I believe this is probably the questions that he had in between. We don't have that in the scriptures, but how do we know? Because here's what Elijah did. He said, where's your son? Give me your son. He takes the son, prays for the son who was dead, and the son rises back from the dead. He rises back from the dead. He comes alive again, and then the widow, what does she say? What does she say? He says in, in verse 18, she said to Elijah, uh, sorry, he says that the woman in verse 24, the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. She had no problems doubting the miracles that God did, but apparently she had doubts about Elijah still. But after this situation, she's like, yep, okay, yep, <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> You're sent by God, that God works in your life, that God moves in your life. You see, in situations that happens in our circumstances that's outside of our control, and sometimes in the midst of God's provision, things happen that we're not aware of because God did not inform us. But if we know God well enough and we trust God and we know that He's going to continue to move as we declare His truth, as we walk in faith, you know what God's going to do? God will confirm the truth we declare, proving He is God and that we are His sent ones, activating believing faith in others. Because God doesn't want just you, Elijah. I don't want just you to know me and you to have faith in me. I brought you here so that others can know me as well. Because this widow had doubts. I wasn't sure. But now that my son was brought back to life, through you, I'm convinced that your God is true. I'm convinced that your God works through you. You really are sent from God as well. 
You see, to experience God's provision in extraordinary days, we must seek His direction, obey His instruction, and trust His Word. That's easy to say, hard to do. You know why it's hard to do? If you don't do it on your regular days. If on normal days, on ordinary days, you are not walking in faith, you are not living in faith, you are not thanking God for the provisions, the protection, the guidance that you receive daily, when extraordinary days, unusual days, times of challenge and, and difficulties come, you are not going to know how to respond the right way, because you have taken for granted what God has given so freely and graciously to you. Come on. Nobody calls out to God in times of plenty because everything's good when you're healthy, when you're strong, when you have all that you need. No, you're just enjoying everything. But for somebody who belongs to the kingdom of God, that is not normal. For the son and a daughter of a heavenly father, it is only right and fitting for us that every day, from morning to evening, we recognize the grace of God. We say, thank you, Lord for this day. This is the day that you have made. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. You made this day. I recognize you in this day. Thank you for health. Thank you for provision. Thank you for protection. If we do that on normal days, on extraordinary and difficult days, that's just going to be the same thing that we do. But if that's not a habit, the prayer habit, the thanksgiving habit, the recognition of God's sovereignty and love and provision and protection habits doesn't happen on normal days. We are going to be like a headless chicken running around on extraordinary days. Have you seen a headless chicken? It's not a pretty sight. First of all, it's not a pretty sight. Now it's an Asian context illustration. But back in the day, when you go to the market, right, it's not frozen. It's alive. Now I remember my parents going to the market and buying native chicken. And my mom, when she was young, she was telling me, you know, her older sister was teaching her how to, how to cook chicken, so they had to buy a live chicken. And she had to <laughs> learn how to, sorry for uh, chicken lovers and animal lovers, eliminate that chicken so that the family could eat. And apparently there are still nerves functioning, even though it's already dead and the feathers are off. The water was boiling. The moment she put that chicken in the boiling water, it stood up. <laughs> I can just imagine. <laughs> because there were nerves. It's not a pretty sight. If, if we are not normally functioning in dependence, daily dependence and recognition of the presence of God, we're going to be just like that chicken. You get in hot water and you stand up and you panic, you start moving around, you don't know what to do. But if every day it's already a norm to recognize the provision of God, the providence of God, the protection of God, the leadership of God, the lordship of God, on difficult days, it's just going to be the same. This is already a habit. This is already my life. This is part of the kingdom life in a broken world. But I have a God who loves me. I have a Heavenly Father who takes care of me, and so I don't need to panic. I don't need to be alarmed like Elijah wasn't. <laughs> I'm just going to obey. What was God's direction? Go to the brook Cherith. I'm just going to go because He's done it before He can do it again. But what you notice is every challenge becomes different, and it seems more difficult than the previous one. To obey God to go to a brook, that's okay. There's stream there. Even if the raven doesn't come, I can drink water, I'll be alive. But the brook dries up. God says, my way of providing for you in this season is over. I want you to go somewhere else. But you know what we do sometimes? I don't want to go, God. <laughs> I enjoy being here. I've already put up my tent here. I have decorations here, right? I've invested here. And God is saying, it's over. Your season in this job, in this community, in this country is over. I want you to go up north. I want you to go somewhere else. Elijah didn't argue because he's like, yep, yeah, okay. He packs up, he goes, and he says, but it's different this time. It's not a stream, it's not a raven, it's a widow. And while you're there, yes, a miracle is going to happen, 
But I'm not going to tell you the sun's going to die. <laughs> but in that situation, I'm going to perform a miracle. Every situation that Elijah was brought to enabled him to build faith. You notice this? Faith increased all the more. Hey, God provided for me at the brook. He sent ravens. Can he do that with strangers and widows? Yeah, right, he's done it. I'm going to believe it for that. And so he goes to the widow, and it, sure enough, after a couple more conversations, eventually, yes, it actually happens. Miracle flows, and he's enjoying it, and all of a sudden, sun dies. Lord, <laughs> you didn't tell me about this. And you know, sometimes we're going to be in situations that God did not tell us about. But what will you do? Elijah did what he normally did on ordinary days. He called on the name of the Lord. And God showed up. And God raised the dead. And God proved he is God. His word is true. This is my servant. You can trust what he says. Do you know what this is what God wants to do in your life? This is God, what God wants to do in your life. When we seek God's direction, obey His instruction, and trust His Word on ordinary days, life will not be as difficult on extraordinary days. There will still be evil, there will still be sin, there will be temptation. Work at times will still be hard. Come on, December, Metro Manila, Christmas season, payday, November 15. It's hard. That was just last Friday. Shout out to my uh, mother-in-law, Mommy Vasey. I love you, Mommy Vasey. I couldn't pick up our daughter <laughs> uh, from school. Our son had commitments in school. My wife was also at work. Mommy Vasey comes to the rescue. Please pick up Ava from school. <laughs> but it's rush hour, payday, Friday. What normally takes 15 minutes took her an hour and a half. Coming back, another hour, that's two hours and 15 minutes just in traffic. I thank God as she's in church today, she has not lost her faith in the Lord and in our family. Life is hard, and sometimes this is so unusual. We would do this, but we have to ask somebody else to do it. It's hard. What we do on normal days affects us on extraordinary days. Even though there is sin and evil in the world, these things make life and work difficult. But what did Jesus say? I know that. That's why I have come, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Yes, I know there's sin in the world, I know there's evil in the world, but you are more than a conqueror. Yes, I know there's sin in the world, and some of you have been trapped in that sin. That's why I came, to seek and to save the lost, to die on the cross, so that you don't have to, so that through my death and resurrection, you can rise up every day and say, you know what? I can live in righteousness. I'm free to live in holiness. I can experience joy in the midst of strife and difficulty and hardship. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. If He is able to rise from the dead, surely I can get up from my bed. Even if I'm tired, even if I'm weary, even if life is hard, Jesus broke the curse of sin and death so that we may have new life. New life, not a better life, not an improved life, right? New life. But we can only understand that new life if we begin to live according to the principles of the kingdom of God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is here and now. Joel, the prophet Joel said, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. You don't have to be a prophet to experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit, to hear from God, to walk in faith. No, God Himself said, if you believe in me, I'll fill you with my Spirit. The same Spirit that filled Elijah, the same Spirit that resurrected Christ from the dead, is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you. Come on! So will God not provide for you? Will God not protect you? Will not God meet every need that you have? Of course, He will. That's his desire. But you need to live in the normal, spiritual, kingdom of God world, even on ordinary days, knowing that your Heavenly Father, who loves you so much, will provide for you. Like Jesus said, 
Look at the birds, look at the grass. They don't even think, they don't even have to toil. Your heavenly Father created you, you are His son, you are His daughter. How much more will your heavenly Father meet the needs that you have, but seek His kingdom first and His righteousness and all that you need will be given. In fact, in the King James, it says, will be added unto you. You already have the kingdom of God. Whatever you have, God's going to add more. You already have salvation, but God's going to add more. Why? Because this is the kind of God that He is. This is the kind of God that He is. One of our prayers when we led a team of 14 to Thailand just a few weeks ago was, Lord, this is our first overseas missions team. Lord, we pray that nobody will get sick, just to be sure everybody get your travel insurance, so everybody bought the travel insurance. Lord, we pray that financial needs will be met. We don't know what the cost will be like. And Father, we ask that every need will be met. The team came together. They all paid their own way. They all bought the travel insurance, and we said, let's raise our operation expenses. The team raised partners, and we're able to raise significant amount of money for our operations, expenses, and we decided, how do we want to spend this? And we said 50% for our daily operation expenses and our missions trip. The 50%, we will bless the ministry partner. This was at the start of the trip. What if we run out of our operations expense? Then we're on our own. You better pray that we don't run out. Let's pray that God's provision comes. Guess what? When we left Thailand, we had extra left, and we were able to give to the ministry that partnered with us. That's God. Second, one of the reasons why my wife also came on this trip was because, you know, as, as a former employee and worker in, in Thailand, she had a bank account. And so, you know, let's, let's keep that bank account open because we never know how God will continue to use that. And so we went there. She went to the bank first day before ministry starts to renew it. A bit of pushback from the bank, you have to go to this branch or that branch, but a bit of pleading and conversation, eventually good customer service says, okay, we'll accommodate you. We'll, we'll update your ATM here, right? Within the same day, she got her ATM, and as you do, you go to the, you go to the machine, check. She knows that there's nothing left there because pretty much used it up. She goes in and it's like, whoa, there's money here talks to the bank. Uh, is there a clerical mistake, a technical error maybe with your system because, you know, this is the amount that I have in my bank account. Nope, everything's okay. It's a miracle. Wow, it's a miracle. There was nothing and now there is something. So we're thinking, you know, we want to bless the team, but we've spent for ourselves. Airfares, travel insurance, Renee, myself, Ava, we're all there in a missions team as well. And we're like, we really don't have extra for this. But guess what? God knew ahead of time and put money in the bank. And we're thinking, where did that money come from? So she's sharing this to one of our friends in Bangkok who'd been living there. Um, she's usually the one in need, but for whatever reason, right, she said, oh, yeah, didn't I tell you I said, a few months ago, I was impressed by the Lord to deposit in her bank account. Wow. She didn't even know we were going there on a mission trip. And so guess what? We were able to treat our team. <laughs> not their own money, not from the operations expenses, but from the money that was there while we were serving the church. Are you, do you want to hear more? There's one more. There's one more. See what happens when you obey God. While we were there, just before the trip ended, somebody outside the country messaged me and he said, you know what? I know the needs you have at ICS Church. I know you have needs, but here's what the Lord impressed upon me. Despite your own needs at ICS Church, you still obeyed to go and serve the nations. And so the Lord impressed upon me to give this amount to ICS Church, not to me, to ICS Church because of your obedience to the Lord. And I'm thinking, I know we have needs at ICS Church. You don't need to tell me that. The board knows we have needs. But God knows more than anybody else. When you follow His direction, provision comes. When you obey His instruction, miracles are released. 
That's why in this church, it's a joy for us to serve because we know we've been given much. We're entrusted with much, but it's not just for us. So when somebody comes and we have the capacity to serve them, whether it's the network of churches that we belong to or a stranger from the body of Christ who says, can we use your facilities? Can we use your people? Can we use your resources? Of course I'm going to say yes. Of course we're going to say, hey guys, hey team, are you okay? And the moment they say yes, we release. Why? Because that's what God does. In this series, we've learned that He is a generous God. And when we practice generosity, we are more like God. When we give of ourselves, of our time, of our treasure, in joy, in cheerfulness, knowing it's not ours in the beginning, then God is glorified. When we follow His direction, when we obey His instruction, provision, miracles are released. This is not exclusive to me. I'm just like you. My faith gets challenged. But this is true for every single person who would put their faith and trust in God. God wants to perform a miracle in your life, in your family, in your community. You just need to obey Him. You need to follow Him. You need to trust Him daily on normal days. So in extraordinary days, you will see extraordinary miracles, extraordinary provision, extraordinary favor that only comes from God. It's undeniable. Only God can do it. So this morning as we end, would you stand? And as we stand, would you turn your faith towards Him today? ICS Church, I know that in this season, there's a reason why God is revealing to us His provision and His generosity in this way. The sources of these provisions is not from the usual. The sources of these provisions a lot of times is from the unusual. And God is saying, I know, and I'm going to take care because you're my child. This is my church. I am the one that's building it. And as my children, loving father, I'm a good father, and I want to provide for what you need, or what you need. We're going to sing a song. It's called Same God. And as we make those declarations today, would you declare that over your life, over your circumstances, about who he is? We're going to ask the team to lead us today. Let's sing together. Circumstances you're in, call upon his name today.
God that we serve, the God that we love, is the God who loves you. He knows your situation. He knows what you're going through. This morning, I know that he would not want you to leave carrying the same burdens, the same challenges, the same overwhelming circumstances that you had when you came in. So our prayer team and our pastors are going to be here. We're here ready to pray with you, for you, because we know that God has a lot that he wants to do for you. He is for you. He's not against you. Sometimes like the widow, we think, you know what, I've got sins, I've got challenges. It might be because of my sin. God is saying, you know what, just turn towards me. Confess, repent, turn towards me, and allow my blessing, my wisdom to flow. So I want to invite you, you know, our time has run out, our time is ended. I'm going to pray a prayer that will conclude us today. And as our prayer team are available to pray with you this morning, they will stay. They will stay, even as we end to pray with you and for you. So Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord God, today. We're grateful for your love for us, for your mercies for us, for your provision for us. Thank you for your word that has reminded us of your availability, your accessibility, of your power, of your provision, of your grace, and of your love. Today, Lord, as we just continue to press in, you're already speaking to some of us about our situations. Lord, help us in faith to take a step in your direction, to trust in you, to wholeheartedly, Lord God, obey your direction, follow your instruction, so that your blessing, your wisdom, your provision, your healing, your miracles would be released over our life. Lord, go with us throughout this week, wherever we go. Guide us, lead us to the things you want us to do. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.